Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? This morning, we're going to be reading out of John 6, 67. So let's go there real quick. Now, before we read the scripture, I would like to offer a very short, quick prayer. If you guys would please join me for this. Lord, we come before you to ask in intercession for those who are struggling. For those who have gotten saved in the last couple of years and are now falling away. Who are getting into things they shouldn't be getting into. Or being convinced by the world to follow them into the darkness. Bring your people back. Lord, bring your people back for your glory. Pray for those who are in pain, who are struggling with those same situations, with those issues. Who are heartbroken because of what they're seeing going on. Lord, please comfort them and give them peace. And for those who would be saved, Lord, I pray you open a door right in front of them that they cannot avoid. For those that need help, I pray you open an avenue for us to be able to go help them if there's any way we can. I know time is short. I know we're really close. I know things are in such a state that it can be hard to do these things, but you're God. You can open a door for anything. So if there's any way that we, as our brothers and sisters, can help, if there's any way we can help each other, Lord, reveal it to us so that we may do it. But until then, we will pray for all those who need something, for all those who are, desire something, or for all those who are hurting, we pray. We lift them up this morning for you to bless them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you guys for joining me for that. I saw some comments on Ross's channel. Um, some people talking about some of the stuff that they were having to deal with, stuff that have, they were having to go through. And so I thought it would be a great opportunity to get you guys involved in this. You guys are an amazing prayer team. So uh, the one lady was talking about how her daughter had, a couple of years ago gotten saved and her biological dad well, she took off and went to live with him they're both supposedly saved a few years ago but now they're in meth and a bunch of other stuff they shouldn't be in and uh, there's a lot of people dealing with similar issues of people now suddenly they, they've been saved for a few years I'm telling you the first five years are the worst time for a Christian and then they go right into the world because the world draws them back it's hard to do. It, it, it's hard to stay focused at that point. But the Lord will bring those that are his out. He said he would. I believe his promises. Okay, let's get into John. And we read John 6. We actually already did John 6. Then Jesus said to the 12, Do you also want to go away? And you remember this was whenever he was, uh, he had offended a bunch of people. So let's go one, two, three, four, five. Here we go. Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. This is key. Our actions profit nothing. The flesh profit nothing. The things of the flesh profit nothing. Um, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, he understood. He saw it. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. Even though they said they did. Here's the thing. These people were false professors, just like we have today. Back then, Jesus knew. He knew who, who they were. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. You can't be saved until the Father draws you, until you have been allowed to be saved. No one can. This is why we pray. We can't save people. I can't go out and preach in the, in, into the wilderness anywhere, in the cities and that, and I can't save people. I can't take somebody, hold them under, in the, under the tank of water. I'm going to baptize you until you get it. When I stop seeing bubbles, then you can come up. We can't make them believe. We can't convince them. I can't convince anybody. It's impossible. It is the Lord that does the convincing. It is the Lord that brings them, draws them, changes them. 
And a lot of people who were hearing this speech didn't understand. And I see pastors talking about this in their sermons now. And this seems like this is something that's only started in the last probably 10 years. But it's really ramping up where pastors are talking about that. There are people in this room that are not saved. And they, they look across the crowd in their church and they point. They said, there's some of you in here that are not going to heaven. You're not saved. And you may not even realize it. Now, some people will get up and leave the church. Well, there's a great indicator right there. But some of them sit there with a blank stare on their face because they're not even listening to what's being said. They literally are oblivious. How do we tell? What do they do the rest of the week when they're not at church? There's a great indicator there. The Bible gives us all the qualifications. What are the fruits of the Spirit? What are the fruits of the flesh? The flesh profits nothing. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. He called out false professors. They realized they were, he was talking to them, and he probably looked right at them, and they walked away. Okay, we're good. They were just there for a free meal, basically. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So Jesus called these people out, false professors that were in their group, to the point that he was driving away thousands of people. Thousands and thousands. Because... The ratio of people that are actually believing is swung very heavily the other direction. The people that are getting saved, it's a small percentage. The people that aren't, the people that are still of the world, is swung way the other direction. That's why the road is broad that goes to destruction. Many there are to find it. Many there are that find it. The road to heaven is narrow and straight, but few there are that find it. I think a big thing about your false professors would be, do they even bother with their scriptures? Oh, they'll have a nice Bible with them. But there's many people I've gone to church with where they get out of their car and they toss the Bible in the seat and that's where it stays. All week. I'm not saying that reading the scriptures is a prerequisite, but it's certainly an indicator if somebody is taking the time to go through the scriptures taking the time to learn. There's a desire in their heart for this. If they like, they enjoy talking about it in their conversation. I know people who seem very saved. And I've tried to have, sit and have conversations with them. And immediately, the response is, let's save that conversation for Sunday. We're on our time now. When I had that conversation with an individual, that was a good indicator to me. Well, that's for Sunday. Let's talk about something else. And one of the times that happened, it was a pastor. Pastor of a church telling me, well, that's a conversation for Sunday. Okay, it tells me all I need to know. I talk about it constantly. Ask my wife. You can ask my wife and she'll tell you, yeah, ad nauseum. Every time we get in a conversation, just about, the dude won't stop. That's, I can't help it. Every conversation I have that has any depth at all will ultimately end up leading into Scripture. And as much as the people I'm talking to try to, do, to derail it to the other to another subject. It always ends up coming back to Scripture. I can't help it. I think that's the difference. I don't know. I may be wrong, but I think that's the difference. Many have forsaken Christ and have walked no more with Him. 
But what reason have you to make a change? Has there been any reason for it in the past? Has not Jesus proved himself all-sufficient? He appeals to you this morning. Have I been a wilderness unto you? When your soul has simply trusted Jesus, have you ever been confounded? Have you not, up till now, found your Lord to be a compassionate and generous friend to you? And has not simple faith in him given you all the peace your spirit could desire? Simple faith, just believe. Can you so much as dream of a better friend than he has been to you? Then change not the old and tried for new and false. As for the present, can that compel you to leave Christ? When we are hard beset with this world or with the severe trials within the church, we find it a most blessed thing to pillow our head upon the blossom of our Savior. This is the joy we have today, that we are saved in him. And if this joy be satisfying, wherefore should we think of changing? Who barters gold for dross? Remember we talked about that yesterday. Purification. Who barters gold for dross? Dross is worthless. You can do nothing with it. We will not forswear the sun till we find a better light, nor leave our Lord until a brighter lover shall appear, and there won't be. And, since this can never be, exactly, <laughs> we will hold him with a grasp immortal and bind his name as a seal upon our arm. As for the future, can you suggest anything which can arise that shall render it necessary for you to mutiny or desert the old flag to serve under another captain? We think not. If life be long, he changes not. If we are poor, what better than to have Christ who can make us rich? When we are sick, what more do we want than Jesus to make our bed in our sickness? When we die, is it not written that neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? We say with Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? And this is the case with those who truly believe, because they can see no other option. We cannot see any other option. Now, there are people we're going to run into in life that say, you know what, I think I'm going to convert to Mormonism. I mean, you know what, I think I'm going to become a Catholic. You know what, I think I'm going to be an atheist for a while. You know what, I think I'm going to be a Baptist. Or I'm going to be Pentecostal. I'm going to be Episcopalian. Basically, the Pentecostals, Episcopalians, and Catholics all kind of lumped in the same group, but be that as it may. I know people, personally, that are like this. They'll jump. They'll convert here, convert there, convert there. What are you doing? And I say, what are you doing? Well, I like the way they church better. It's not about how somebody churches. It's about Jesus Christ and faith in him. You're jumping from denomination to denomination because it's a sideshow. You enjoy the dog and pony show. You enjoy the presentation. You're going back and forth because it makes you feel good. Because it lifts you up and elevates you for that day. And then the rest of the week, you go back to being the an animal and living in the beggarly elements. It's not about the size of the building. It's not about the people. It's not about the show being put on. It's about the Lord. It's always about the Lord. Give me a bunch of trucks backed up in a circle with the tailgates down. And that's the best church in a Sunday in a Walmart parking lot. That's the best church you can have. Give me some benches in the middle of a cornfield or even some tree stumps in the middle of a cornfield. That's the best church you're going to have. That's real church. In a barn, in a horse stall, on a hay wagon, in a living room. That's church. That's church. Because they're there for Jesus, they're not there for them. And ultimately being there for Jesus ends up, it is for them. But it's not about the building, it's not about the show, it's not about what we can offer. Oh, y'all got any programs for kids? No, we really don't. Okay. We might find somebody else because we need somebody who can uh, have some programs for kids. Volleyball programs, youth pastors. They're looking for babysitters. 
Tell me I'm wrong. They're looking for babysitters. We had parents that would come up there during vacation Bible school at my last church. Drop their kids off and they couldn't leave fast enough. Babysitters. And after dealing with their kids for a few minutes, it became very evident why they dumped them off because they didn't want to deal with them. Because their kids were, some of them kids were horrible. Of course, some of the people that were there weren't very accommodating, but we understood, me and my wife, so we actually had a really good time with the kids and got along with them and understood how they worked and worked them through this instead of just the other people there being mean to them. And they were very mean to them. And I told the pastor about that. And he just kind of chuckled it off. Like, if you want people to come back, you got to not do that. And what was funny is, is that the other people in the church were mad that we were getting along with the kids. I'm watching all this stuff and I'm like, this is lunacy. No one is even beginning to pay attention. Are you bothering to look and see how would the Lord do this? This is a problem, and I think this is a big dividing issue. Not dividing as in people disagreeing on it. It's separating wheat and tares. Because I think we're really going to be shocked who tares are in the church. I think we're really going to be shocked, in some cases, who the wheat are. Now, we're not going to know till we get to heaven, till the sons of God, the true sons of God are revealed. But like we talked about the other day when I answered Pipey's question. Two scriptures seemingly linked, but having two different contexts and using two different words to, re re to uh, reference the person. Wheat and tares. And it's right in our own communities, in our own churches, in our own groups. Wheat and tares. Tares aren't out in the unbelieving world. Tares are in the church. That's why he said there's wheat and tares in the same field. Well, the church would be the field. The tares are sown in the church, not outside the church. So when you see that wheat and tares, that's talking about the community of quote-unquote Christians, the quote-unquote church in the world today. And there's a bunch of those people that are going to be burned. Because even though they sit there and they look at the pastor and they put their hands in the air and they sing the songs and they're very, very vocal and very adamant, they're no more saved than the heathen in the street. That's terrible. How do we know? Sometimes you can't tell. But for me, the big indicator has, has been who are they the rest of the week? Are they the same person Saturday night that they are Sunday morning? Yep, my last pastor used to talk about this bar that was up the road about a mile and a half. They had good barbecue there. But this bar, and, and he was he would talk in a lot of sermons about people going there, you know, and talk down about it. And I'd sit in the back, and I'd say, I know that person goes. I know those two people go. I know that person go because all those people admitted it to me. And I'm sitting here and I'm looking and I'm like, okay, so these people go to that bar. He's talking about that bar. He's got to know they go down there. What's the problem? In fact, one of the people for sure is down there every Friday and Saturday night. She's a bar fly. But nobody batted an eye when the pastor read him the riot act about going in there. But he never directed it directly at anybody. Of course, it was funny too because there was a bunch of times he directed stuff right at me in his sermon. I thought that was interesting. And I would make sure to go up and tell him.
And that message felt like it was directed right at me. And he'd look at me real funny. <laughs> I kind of played it off though. I knew he was talking about me. But he sure didn't have, he sure didn't want to say anything to those other people because they wrote big old checks for tithing. So you can't offend those that tithe you. you Got to be careful. See, it's the little details that make, that tell a big story. Who are these people when they're not in church on Sunday? Who are these people at night when no one's looking? Who are these people in the daytime when no one is looking? Integrity. Integrity. And it is a shocking example of what Jesus was dealing with in John 6. That the tares are sown among the wheat. The tares are around us. And again, I go back to what I've said many times before. Any church congregation with 100 people, roughly 10% are the only ones that are saved. The rest of the people are not. No matter how good they seem, no matter how involved they are. Because if things don't go their way, they are quick to leave and go somewhere else. They'll even go to a church they don't like. To me, that's hypocrisy. Because of the reasons that they do it. terrible situation but it's a re it's a reality they were dealing with 2,000 years ago how many people were tares sown in the church some of them even leaders some of them named by name just wait till the day that we stand in heaven before the Lord and who actually ends up there there are going to be pastors that aren't going to be there. Pastors that will not be in heaven. How is that possible? Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this word and this devotion. Some of the truths that are contained within your scripture sometimes aren't very kind or, or very, very uh, likable. But we don't have to like it for it to be true. And even though it may not be something comfortable for us to know or for us to realize, it's still truth. One of those truths is... Not everybody who says they're a Christian is a Christian. Or not everybody who goes to church is really saved. Not everybody who calls you Lord is really yours. And you make this evident. They will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? And you say, I never knew you. Tears sown among the wheat. So much of your scripture connects on this. So much of your scripture aligns on this and tells us the truth. The, the fruits of the Holy Spirit are not fruits done on Sunday. They're fruits done every day. We live like this. We live the armor in Ephesians 6. We live the way the word tells us to live. Well, there's our litmus test. There's our indicator of who we're dealing with. If a person doesn't live that way outside of the church, What does that tell us? Judas did miracles, partook in all of that, witnessed it with his own eyes. He stood right next to the Lord, embraced him, and still wasn't saved. He is an example of how close you can get and still not be converted. Father, may that not be the case for any of us. May we all be saved. But may we also have discernment 
and realize the truth and the reality of the matter that most of the people we deal with are not saved and they're not going to heaven. So we pray for them. We lift them up, Lord, that since they're standing right there at the door, bring them in the threshold. Open their understanding. Open their eyes that they see what they've been doing and repent and become saved. How can a person stand in a pulpit and preach from your word and still not be any more saved than the heathens, than the earth dwellers, than the people out on the street, the average everyday person? How is this possible? Well, it used to be we couldn't tell. Well, now it's pretty easy to tell because they're out there letting it, everybody know what exactly what they're doing and what they believe in. That it's not you. It's not your word. It's hard to find a good church that even has a Bible in it nowadays. In the cities, you get out here in the country, it's a little easier. Incredible. And I see all these crosses on vehicles and hanging from rearview mirrors. They got their little bobblehead Jesus or Mary on the dashboard. And they think that's good enough. Graven images, idols. That's not worshiping you. The Father, you've given us a heart to worship you, a heart to pray, a heart to have compassion. But you've also given us a heart and an understanding and a desire to hate the things you hate. And we hate what they do because they're not glorifying you. And what's even worse, because that just deals with them, is that they're leading others to do the same thing. How horrible. How horrible to... And, and they're going to find out on that day. How horrible to, to spend your whole life walking through the church and then come to the end of your life and realize you didn't never, you never crossed the threshold. And it can be shocking and disturbing. A lot of us are going to be very disturbed at who doesn't go. But I think, you know, once we convert, it's not going to matter anyway. We're going to have a different frame of mind. Because we're going to realize they were never going to. They made their choice. How can they stand so close and not be changed? Judas is our example. He stood right next to you. And still did not believe. We have a record in your word You're talking about uh, Simon the Magician. It says, your word says, he believed and was baptized. And the first thing that happened to him was getting a rebuke. Your money perish with you. You better pray the Lord grants you repentance. The man wasn't saved, but he believed. But he didn't get converted. Lord, may that not be the case with any of us. Reveal to us, if that if we're falling short, reveal to us so that we may change, so that we may repent, so that we may turn to you for salvation. What a horrible, horrible mess to see the things that we see, to, to not be able to go to a church in our area. God, the one lady in 2019 moved to three different countries just to try to find a church that taught the Bible. That's amazing. But you've done something incredible in that you've created this online service because it's so hard to find something in your area. I don't trust any of the churches in my area. I haven't been to all of them, but I don't trust them. I've gotten a few opportunities to see certain things and they don't, not appealing. But when I go past those buildings and I think, you know, most of the people in that building probably aren't saved. And it's a hard truth, but it's still sometimes very disturbing how that can be. I, sometimes I still struggle with how that is possible. To be so close and yet as far away as anyone else 
Father, I pray it isn't so. I pray these people get saved. I pray we're all in the threshold, in the sheepfold. I know it's only supposed to be a few, but I still pray for them because I have compassion for them. But if they're evil, if they're doing things wrong, if they're there for selfish ambition, Lord, we don't want none of that. I, I desire to hate the things you hate. And to don't want to be a part of the things you don't want us to be a part of. I want to fulfill your word. But it's still disturbing and troubling to witness. And our Lord got a good taste of it when he was here. In fact, he saw it on a much broader scale than we could ever see it. Because he knew what was in people's hearts. He knew who would believe and who wouldn't. And to this day, you still know who will believe and who won't. You know exactly who the tares are. Your will be done, no matter what. Your word be fulfilled, no matter what. Because in that, you are glorified. But I thank you that you've opened our eyes to be able to see, even just a little bit, through your word of the things going on around us so that we won't be taken in by this world and caught up in what they're doing, but instead to stand for truth and to glorify you. Father, thank you for your mercy and grace and thank you for your great love. Thank you for this truth, this perfect truth, as harsh as it may be sometimes, perfect truth. Thank you for your free gift of salvation you've given to offer to all men. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. We thank you again for your word, your word of truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for a morning devotion. It's, it's disturbing to know this, to realize this, but it is the truth. We can't change it. People are going to do what they're going to do. There's nothing we can do about that. There's nothing we can do to change that except to live the life he gave us in their presence. And maybe, just maybe, they'll get to see what an actual believer looks like, and that will cause them to change. The Lord will open their eyes and grant them repentance. They'll have that moment of clarity and go, oh, I've been doing this wrong this whole time. And come and join us in the presence of the Lord. Because I tell you this as a matter of factly as I can, and I've seen evidence of it, most people that are going to churches, they're not there yet. And there will be entire church populations left here after the rapture. What are they going to do? What are they going to feel? How terrible would that be? Hopefully we never get to experience it. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I will see you in the next video.